Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi for Root Loop. What you know? This one is a little crazy because I have blue eyes, but did you know that research shows that all blue-eyed people may be related? That's weird. Yeah, so it says they, at least they may share the same distant ancestor. So after studying the DNA of blue-eyed individuals from Scandinavia, Turkey, Jordan, and India, Danish researchers found that they all had identical gene sequences for eye color. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, this called, they believe the trait comes from a single individual called the founder whose genes mutated between six and 10,000 years ago. Yeah, I heard that blue eyes is a genetic mutation. Yeah, that's what redheaded people are. Oh, I had a kid to... ask me, uh, we were doing this thing at, at this Bible school and they asked me, uh, we were talking about just how your body's made and, and, um, Stuff like that, and what causes your skin, which is oh, what's the M word? Mel 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 melatonin. No, melanin. melanin. Melanin is what causes your skin to be either light or dark or whatever. And then we talked about hair color, and the little girl said, "Well, why am I redheaded?" And I was using a puppet, and I was like, "How do I tell a kid that you're a mutant?" Because <laughs> I mean, I am. So that's but, funny. Yeah. I'll, I, as a kid, I mean, I have hair color now, but I I was redheaded. So yeah. There you go. Um, so we want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. You can go to twocoolt-shirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. Check her out. You can get um, quilts and pillows and all kinds of really cool stuff. So check her out. She'll know we sent you. And what can they do, Fruit Loop? They can take your t-shirts and make them into a quilt that is too cool. I have my Yankee ones ready. I'm just getting an address where to send it. I've there you go. Andrea and I, so. so before we get started, I had the, the, the big sleepover for my daughter's five, 10 year old friends this weekend. And it went surprisingly well. There was no drama. Uh -oh. None. However, I did reemerge from my bedroom like once every 45 minutes to make them clean up. And then the, the only two times I had to calm down and I, I never, I tweeted this out. I never thought I'd say this in 2022 at my daughter's sleepover. Do not attempt the dirty dancing lift was number one. And then I'm in my room watching a documentary and I hear these screams and I go and they're all piled in the bathroom trying to summons Bloody Mary. And I'm like, oh no, I don't need oh, any no. entities running around my house right now. Uh, we did that when we were younger. Oh, we yeah. It was uh, It's a mind thing, you know. But look, I'm at the age, I don't chance nothing. I don't need nothing running around my house. No. So I made them stop. Between the sleepover and the time change, though, I'm on another planet right now. I'm so tired. Dude, I just want to say baseball is back. I'm so pumped. I know. Man. Yeah. Yankees so, play Friday. Oh, really? Okay, I have to watch. Yep. yep. So we are sort of revisiting something we started really about a year ago. I was just looking through JPay, which is the email service for inmates. And it was like March that I started of last year that I started uh, talking to somebody I know. So we have a lot of new listeners. So just a really quick rundown of how this works. Somebody that I grew up with from the time I was probably about nine through my teen years, uh, she is in prison in California for life. She kind of fell under that umbrella ruling of if somebody dies during the commission of a felony, everybody involved gets the murder charge. She's life without parole. We have past episodes of this series. You can go to our, uh, anywhere that you um, listen to our podcast back then we were not doing YouTube. So these are things you have to listen to. Eventually, I'd like to get them on YouTube, but it's just going to be with a picture. So some of this stuff, if you've listened before, a few of these things are repetitive. But I've been talking to her a lot more lately than I have in the past couple of months just because life and life for her and my life. So we have a lot of defendants that we're covering that are first timers. These are going to be first time going to prison 
which yeah. is way different than jail for a million reasons. And we're going to go through some of the things that you're going to experience in prison that you may not have to deal with in jail. So I just want to say I am not one of those that's going to advocate for her release or anything. I trust the, the judicial process. She was found guilty by jury, and I completely respect that verdict. I'm still all these years later in shock that she's in prison. She reached out to me when I was pregnant with my oldest Taylor or no, I'm sorry, right after I'd had her and you know, we kind of kept in touch, but then new mom, newborn, just, I didn't have time. So we lost touch. And then about a, well, about a year ago, you remember she mailed a letter to my house to see if I still lived here. And then we, I signed up for JPay, keeping regular contact with her. It's been enlightening to talk to somebody who is living it every day because according to her, what you see on TV and TV shows and even prison documentaries is kind of sensationalized. It's not really how it goes in there. Some things are true, but she said even with the documentaries that she's watched, people put on an act while they're on camera, of course. And so it's reality is very different. Well, so, plus too, right? COVID changed a lot. COVID changed a ton. Just uh, lots of lockdown, lots of being stuck in your cell for sometimes weeks at a time. It's no joke. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the backstory. Um, do I feel sorry for her? Not really. Um, I care about her as a person. We've shared some fun times. We went to summer camp a few summers um, in like middle school, that kind of thing. But you know, she made a choice of who she was around and here she is. So no, I don't sit here and feel sorry for her. So back when we were doing this, we were doing a prison slang word of the day. And so for this one, a frequent flyer is somebody who is regularly incarcerated, like a revolving door, frequent flyer. Currently over 2 million people are incarcerated in the U S that may be a little bit of an older number uh, by a couple of years, but jail versus prison why is it so different? Well, county jail, people are there for smaller charges, misdemeanors, usually a year or less, not super violent criminals. And it's full of people like Lori and Chad, well, not Lori at the moment, Chad, Letitia, all those guys who are waiting for trial are doing this in a county jail. So what you don't see is a lot of the big problems you see in prison because People don't want to add time if they're there for a smaller sentence. And then people go into trial, don't want anything to look bad on them when they're trying to get either off of the charges or hopefully a good sentence. So she said that the differences are night and day and life without parole is a small acronym for such an overwhelming reality. Now we know that a lot of prisons are different. This is not, necessarily common in every prison across the u.s but this is unique to her prison and so she has shared with me what goes on so in county jail i asked her about high profile inmates she said oftentimes they will be isolated from other prisoners and this can be both a blessing and a curse the blessing is you are alone and you are pretty free of drama the curse is when you get sentenced and you go to prison, you have no idea how to play the game. You are at a disadvantage if you've been in isolation while you're awaiting trial. And that I'm makes sure. sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, perfect sense. I'm going to say, Tom Hanks and Castaway, being isolated, it'll make you go crazy. I'm going to tell you, I, I, don't think I, I, I don't think I would complain right now. I could use a vacay. Hey, but I don't, I don't want to be no, I want to talk to somebody. You could talk to the volleyball. No, then you paint a face on a volleyball and call it Wilson. <laughs> Look, I ain't going to lie. I got a little emotional when Wilson floated away. Hey, yeah, that was a crazy movie. So I think the thing here is you're looking at Lori, Chad, Letitia, Barry, Morphew. You're looking at all these people who never have been in trouble their whole life. So not only are they first timers, they are big first timers well known yeah and you think about lori she wants to prim and prop you know proper print proper whatever tan and bed i mean you know what i mean like tan hair nails and you ain't getting it 
No. So why don't you start here? Uh, so while awaiting your transfer to prison, you can only replay regrets and build your fear of what is to come. Uh, in her case, she said during the months I was with other prisoners, I had a cellmate who had been to prison who tried to, pre to prepare me for prison. It was helpful, but the reality is there is no preparing yourself. And I, I mean, you can imagine, like you see it on movies where they're going in the bus from jail to prison. And when you get there, it's just like shock. Well, we did an episode months and months ago about that transport from jail to prison. And it's very in-depth. Now, the diff... We also have one that a lot of people really thought was interesting. She was pregnant when she got arrested and gave birth in jail. She was in jail three and a half, almost four years waiting on trial. So she gave birth very early on. She was super pregnant when she went in. And um, that's a whole episode too. So go back and listen. Sorry, we don't have video, but yeah, we just weren't, you know, that open we back then to being seen yeah. all the time. So a kind of numbness sets in after conviction and sentencing. Uh, this is this has been true for most of the girls that she's lived with and spoken with. Uh, you just want to get it over. Uh, the hours on the transport bus are surreal. Fear and numbness takes turns being in control. There are metal shackles on your wrist and ankles for the ride. Uh, and she says she was in a, sim a cage similar to what you saw on Con Air. Uh, you were given a lice wash, and that smell lingers for days. Intake is to the point with staff asking point blank, if you die, who do we call? Uh, after processing, you're given a bedroll and sent to your building and cell. For the most part, the first few days and weeks can be at a temporary building with other new intakes as the processing continues. Uh, the reception here is a vicious place. Cases involving children are encouraged by staff to lie, but it gets them beaten up later for the case. And then for lying and being a coward, uh, if the attacks become life-threatening, then staff will move the person to protective custody. The adjustment from jail to prison is huge. It's a shock to the system in many ways. Uh, it's the first time you realize you are a lifer. Uh, in jail, you have some hope while awaiting trial. You think in the back of your mind that you would be acquitted at trial and leave jail to rejoin the world. And then once the bus opens its doors, the shackles come off and you're placed in a group holding cell. You're strip searched all together in one room. People also are questioning each other about their cases, time and affiliations, and you have medical and psych exams. So some prisons have dental exams and for a lot of the first time they went to a dentist was in the first week of prison. Yeah. And the one thing too, that, that she has repeatedly told me is prison is not full of just hardened drug addicts or uneducated people or gang members. There's every walk of life. It's just, so she said in jail, you kind of dream about what you will do when you get out and who you will see, where you will eat, what clothes you're going to wear. And then when the sentence is handed down in court, you, you really feel like your life is over and reality hits like a ton of bricks that this could be the rest of your life. She said, you feel like an alien walking in with the other new arrivals and everybody stares at you. They try to size you up. And she said, you almost feel like you're on display. You have zero privacy anymore. None. Using the toilet, showering, somebody is always nearby. If you're not in the line of sight, somebody is nearby. Yeah. She said on average, just for herself and what she has seen with other first timers, it takes a couple of years to really kind of feel comfortable at all in prison. It's a very different world. And she said prison overload is real. And it's the overwhelming feeling of helplessness or any area of your own life, the rules, the people, the overcrowded conditions, the food, mediocre medical care, the... um Let's see. Uh, somebody was texting me and I looked up and now I'll, uh, the yelling, the fighting, the bickering, the pettiness, the drunk idiots raising a ruckus, the grown adults who are acting like immature children, the coldness of people and the environment. Some of the days and nights seem endless. 
the Sounds like high school. What? Sounds like high school. <laughs> <laughs> she said, the loneliness, the smells, the taste, the sounds, and the fact that it feels like it will never end. She said sometimes she feels like she doesn't age, that she's been the same age for years because time goes so slow in there. It's like Groundhog Day. Right. That's exactly the phrase she used. She said it's yeah. just like Groundhog Day. She says sometimes it's so chaotic from sun up to sundown and that it feels it fills the air so bad you can almost taste it. She said that prison is flat out scary, humiliating, and humbling. You're not in control of a single element in your life except for the thoughts in your head. And she says sometimes you're not in control of those. One inmate described going to prison as being in a hostile country and you don't know anything about the language or the customs and you're dropped off there with nothing on you. Listen, you remember when we was in middle school, we had those people that would come talk and they were, they'd been in prison for stuff and they were on a team. It was like a team of like, I don't know, 10 people. And it was a mixture of male and female and they would come in and share their story trying to get your attention to say uh don't do this do you you probably don't because you, you're foggy about stuff that happened in school and stuff sometimes what the heck you talking about i'm foggy you foggy i don't remember it so see exactly i can remember no was, i do remember actually there was a kid we were in the gym there was a kid and i forgot who the kid was but he was cutting and acting a fool and that guy pointed him out and he said, boy. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and he said, you're going to be right here one day. You're going to be where I'm at. And I was like, oh, my goodness. We went to middle school with somebody who murdered somebody and is in yeah. prison. He, that was when he was like 17. He's still in there. Yeah, it wasn't that. He wasn't the one that got pointed out, though. But I was like, oh. But yeah. it was like, I mean, it impacted me. I mean, I don't want to be a criminal anyways, but uh sheesh yeah it's i can't imagine mm. um she said on the days when prison overload is really big it feels so heavy that addiction self-harm self-sabotage they all become real options sleep becomes an addiction drugs alcohol food coffee anything becomes a crutch she said that prison is constantly loud you never have pure quiet doesn't matter what time of day it is. There's always some noise in jail. Uh, she said it was quieter at times and the adjustment from going to, you know, from sort of a quieter environment to just hundreds and hundreds of people, it can drive you insane. And they don't have earplugs in prison. Her trick is to get pieces of wet toilet paper and shove them down her ears. She be my luck and get lodged. And they'd be like, you can't go to medical for a week. Yeah, you end up having toilet paper, like something growing out your ears. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot to say at the beginning of this. How about last night my daughter's car got broken into? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, she was all upset. For some reason, they took her insurance card for her car. And she had some little crystals in there because she loves crystals. And she was all upset. And I was like, okay, yeah. number one, let's not leave anything in your car. And number two, yeah, it is a bad feeling. Do you, you remember better. when somebody slipped my top open on my Mustang yep. side That's to side? Right. It's a bad feeling. We normally don't have any problems in this neighborhood. And of course my camera didn't get it, but I have that, that cos cosmetology head really creepy looking. And then I have a Halloween decoration. It's like some guy peeking through the window, the head's going in her car tonight and the peekers going in my window in my car. And then I got my sensitivity on my camera set to like really sensitive. Oh God, you they come back. You you gonna be putting batteries and them things every other day. Dude, my dog was barking close to one. We think that's when they were out there. You better call your insurance company. Somebody might be trying to take your insurance. That's true. Yeah, they might. Share. Anyway, sorry. Just yeah. <clears throat> we chased the squirrel. <laughs> uh, so the homesickness is consuming. You can't prepare for it or avoid it. Uh, she sees most people lose their religion than gain it. See, well, I'd be right opposite. Yeah. No, she said, especially lifers, they, she said people can come in there and they are reading their Bibles the first week. And then by the end of the first month, they, there is no God. You yeah. know, this. So what adversely affects the staff will eventually adversely affect the inmates. 
in the jail she was in while awaiting trial, she would stay in her bunk away from others to avoid drama. And that was easy. Uh, in jail, your laundry was brought to you. Only low levels went to chow hall, the library, and classes, so it was relatively safe. In prison, unless someone was in the shoe or locked down, you are mingling with every type of personality you can imagine. Uh, and you have to learn to deal with it. Yeah. You can't ask to be moved or be sent to another cell block. And if you could, it would be the same thing there anyways. Yeah. She said, like, go ahead. It, I was going to say, it's not like they have, okay, these are the like, you know, small yeah. stuff you did in this cell block. And yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, there's an unwritten code of prison you're supposed to know, but are never taught such as how to deal with unpleasant people which guards have pet peeves and how not to set them off and how not to make yourself vulnerable. If you come in with a chip on your shoulder and disrespect people initially or act high and mighty, you are a huge target. Uh, some inmates will do things early on to deflate all that. You never know who an inmate is friends with. And while it may not bother the recipient of the disrespect, she has seen their friends take over the punishment. You can't bring anything with you except the clothes on your back, eyeglasses, and a list of medications you take from a doctor. Uh, initially, during her transition from jail to prison, she had a hard time resolving in her mind that she would never hug family again, and she would lose those she loved one by one as she sat in her cell. Uh, some days feel endless, with some 24 hours feeling like a month. Yeah. And... She said the the confuse one of the most confusing things for her was learning the schedule for the unlocking of the cells. And there's an announcement over the PA where she's at. And if you miss it, you miss it. Um, no, you better not have that toilet paper in your ears. Exactly right. But you know, it, it's supposed to be at the same time every day, but it never really is because staff doesn't come on. You know, sometimes staff meetings take longer. Whatever, if they're dealing with a unruly inmate all that affects it. So it's not like you set your watch and you know, every day they don't open it for anyone. So if you miss like breakfast and lunch, you eat at supper. Um, so if you're lost in your music with your earbuds and miss the call, you're in for part of the day. And that's just the way it is. Usually the first month in at least where she was, you don't get to, to get your commissary yet. It takes a little while to get all that set up. So you don't have anything other than the clothing and the meals they offer in the chow hall. No TV, no radio, no clock. She said keeping track of time is really hard because you don't just go up and ask an inmate, what time is it? She says it's just not when you're new, it's not something you do. One thing that she's seen too is sometimes new arrivals have to give, do what they call give 50, which is giving half of your first few commissary purchases to other inmates. Every good deed done by another inmate has a price, though. Not much is from the kindness of hearts in there. So the thing is, too, when, you know, an inmate may say, hey, look, you don't get commissary. Let me give you a couple of bags of chips. And people that are unsuspecting, well, thank you. Aren't you so sweet? Well, then a month later, they're coming to call the favor. Yeah, comes at a price. And the favor might be run some drugs for me. Uh, I want you to hook up with me, whatever. You don't set the terms or they might double up what you owe them. As you can imagine, the possibilities are endless. Dude, Chad and Lori are going to get eaten alive. They are going to get eaten alive. Because here's the thing. They're not going to be able to spend their entire lives in protective custody. They will be a part of the community. Mm -hmm. The higher profile you are, the bigger target you are for a lot of people. Yeah. So... Wake up time for her is 6 a.m. with staff change. They come over the intercom. They give instructions. She said it's never really dark in your cell, and you have to hear everybody snores and body functions all night. She, she said prison is full of manipulators, as you can imagine. A lot of people go into prison thinking they have a little bit of an advantage if they were particularly good at being manipulative on the outside. <laughs> Lori. But inside, you're likely to be really inexperienced in prison manipulation and terrible at manipulating other inmates. Some of these women have been in since they were 17, 18, and they're in their 40s and 50s. This is their home. Yeah. They have seen every type of inmate 
walk in and walk out. What you have to remember, all these are not law-abiding citizens. Exactly. These are violent or big-time felons. I mean, you don't go to prison for misdemeanors. And you well, have some people have who, who do have a change of heart, and they're, they're good. They're right. good people in there. But, I mean, you're looking at people who haven't obeyed the law. Right. Um, or you look at people that, and one thing she said is you'll see somebody who came in terribly addicted to drugs and they do great in prison and you think, wow, they're going to make it. And then six months later they're back in because, you know, and there's a whole other issue. People that, that are released, they don't get the, the education that they need in prison to be successful on the outside. It's a revolving door a lot yeah. of times. Yeah. So, um, um, so uh, this is especially hard for manipulators that are coming in for the first time. Most of the time, it doesn't take long for that to be realized by these older inmates. And they're essentially stripped bare on that level. You have to earn respect in there. And if you think you're going to out manipulate people that have been in this system since they were kids, you're wrong. So you have so much controlled movement in prisons for a million reasons. You can't just wander into any area. Areas oftentimes are claimed by racial groups or gangs. It's the same with the chow hall. Chow hall in the yard, it's almost segregated, self-segregated. This gang goes here, this group goes here, and you don't just go and talk to everybody. Dude, um, I be telling out through the toilet, like... Uh, Shawshank? Yes. Yeah, I be, I be digging out. I be waiting in the getaway car for you. Yeah, I'll be digging out. So the thing is, nobody cares how powerful or successful you were on the outside. In prison, you are in with severely mentally ill patients, homeless inmates, blue collar, super wealthy. There is no middle ground for the type of inmates you're surrounded by. And if you let it be known that you came from money, you're a target because favors in the form of having your family on the outside, put money on books for other inmates, or, hey, this person might hurt, you need to put money on this person's books. It, you become a nonstop target. Suicide attempts are common in the first few months for new inmates. If those who are struggling big time to adapt and they don't attempt it, she said she's seen so many just check out emotionally, people almost comatose, just mentally gone. They may be moved to a mental unit, but almost always they come back because there's just too, there's too many mentally ill people for staff to accommodate and they're integrated into the prison population. So she said, essentially, you have to cross your fingers and hope to God you aren't the victim of some just random attack. Yeah. You reading the stuff before that about the money and all, I, th I immediately went to Murdoch. Uh, yeah. What he's having to deal with because they all know who he is. But he also was asking them to put money on somebody's books. Yeah. So it makes me think maybe he's he's getting protection in there, or I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of reasons you put money on somebody's books, but. Yep. yep. So using drugs is also a common way to check out emotionally. Uh, she has seen middle class and high society women come in for nonviolent crimes with no history of drug use, and in no time they're addicted to hard drugs. Uh, the reality of prison is sometimes too much for people to come to terms with, so they turn to other things. I mean, you're trying to make it go away. I, I could get that. Yeah. But I'm going to draw the line at drinking hooch made in the toilet. No. Mm -mm. Nope. Not drinking no toilet water. Mm -mm. So the higher profile the criminal, the more they're targeted. Uh, people get jealous if your case made you known far and wide. Uh, breaking that persona is one of the first things to happen to new, more infamous inmates. If you hurt a kid, it's even worse. So they got tons of things. They got strikes against them before they ever enter. And not only that, but even if your case wasn't high profile, uh, inevitably somebody's going to ask you very early on, what did you do? How long are you in for? The thing is, if you lie about hurting a child, you did hurt a child, but you say it was drugs, they will find out. Sometimes the guards will, or they'll have somebody on the phone. Hey, look up this person and see what they're in for. And then if it's like some crime against a kid and you say it's drugs, you're screwed. Yeah. In the movies, it's always somebody cleaning the offices. And they'll say, find out what they did. And they look through the files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so some profile, high profile inmates will find a group that offers them physical protection. That's what we just talked about. Uh, emotional abuse never stops causing the inmate to constantly expect something to happen to them. Yep. Um, she's in with some pretty high profile inmates. And the reason I'm not saying her name, where she's at or who she's in with is because the information that she gives me could make her kind of a target for staff. If they yeah. feel that she is, you know, if we're trying to, if it, she doesn't want it to, you know, seem like we are advocating for change because it comes back on her. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's yeah. Yeah. So prison seems like you're trapped in the drama of high school, but you don't go home at the end of the day. Uh, in jail, you mostly have free time. Uh, some meet with their lawyers more often than others. So free time isn't always an all day for some. Uh, in prison, things are more uniformed with scheduled times to be out in common areas. Uh, where she is, you are required to attend programs such as jobs or school or treatment programs. Uh, if you don't show up, you get written up and there are consequences. Uh, in her bunk, there are eight living in a 19 by 24 foot cell. It has two sinks and a toilet with no privacy. She said no, no body function is private. You can get on people's bad list quick for things like if your poop smells up the cell or you have gas. Uh, dangling your feet off the top bunk can get your nose busted. Uh, that's a big sign of disrespect. So do you want to stop here and then we can do part two tomorrow? Because this is pretty yeah. long stuff. I'm still not done going through emails. Um, I'm actually going to have a phone conversation with her later tonight. There's some things that just was a little hard to type out that she wanted to, to add for this. And so we will, we will finish this up tomorrow. It's very interesting because, you know, the one thing that she said that makes a lot of sense is that people tend to assume that prisoners have it good, three hots and a cot. You know, you always hear that argument, but you know, rightfully so, when you are accused of a crime and it's been proven that you committed that crime, there are consequences and it's not a cakewalk. But it it is, um, it's just like a society within a society. Yeah. That you can't imagine until you, you know, are unfortunate enough to screw up big enough to where you go to prison. Yeah. I'd die. Dude, I'd be the one in the corner crying for a month. Dude, I'd flush myself down the toilet. I'd have failure to thrive. But, you know, here's the thing, too. One quick thing I didn't put in the notes. Sometimes people will go on hunger strikes to protest conditions or whatever. After a while, they can get a court order to force feed you. They will not let you sit there and waste away. So, you know, um, yeah, prison stinks, y'all. It's coming for us, all these people, I think, that we cover. So, anyways, we'll be back with episode two tomorrow. Follow us on YouTube. Subscribe. Share the podcast with your friends and uh, we appreciate you guys and see you tomorrow.